Alrighty, class. Today, we're going to talk about Matt Swayze. Isn't that funny? Doesn't that sound everybody's idea of your life? <laughs> Almost thought of like a joke. I don't know. So let's get mass wasted. That's not that funny though. Or maybe it is funny. I don't know. Okay. Mass wasting. Uh let's see. So what they're talking about in mass wasting, we went over this last semester, is like land sizes. Land or or some sort of Soil or rocks, or you could even say snow, uh, avalanches could be considered mass wasting. Um, pulled down by gravity. That's the key here. It's got to be gravity activated. Um, so you're talking something on a steep slope or some sort of slope. Uh, it's not just flat land. It's got to be going kind of downhill. So we do have another chapter. The next chapter is soil and subsidence. Um, and we will actually talk about some similar stuff but not quite the same slope going downhill because of gravity stuff. So uh, we're gonna go through this pretty quickly, hopefully. This is your example for this chapter, the La Conchita, Southern California landslide disaster. So um, in 2005, they had this really big landslide, 400,000 ton landslide. Um, and just to put this into perspective, every, uh, does everybody know what a ton is? A ton is 2,000 pounds, so it's it's 400,000 times 2,000, so you're talking 8 million pounds of land, right? No, no, no. 400,000 times 2,000 would be like 8, 80 billion? No, 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 1,000, three zeros, I'm adding three zeros to it, I'm sorry, this is bad today. Uh, is that a trillion? Why am I having so much trouble with 800 million. Huh? 800 million. 800 million, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I trust you in your calculator. Uh, so, yes, 800 million pound landslide on January 10th, 2005. Um, the thing is, this had happened before. Um, it was the same location as a 1995 landslide. So, this one in 2005 destroyed about 30 homes and 10 people lost their lives. Um, and after that happened, they kind of, everybody's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This has happened before. I thought this was supposed to be fixed. Um, so in, after the 1995 one, they did a study and it showed that landslides are common in this area and it's probably gonna happen again. So they're like, get ready. Um, and they did a complete stable, or they say a complete stabilization would be about $150 million. Um, and again, this kind of maybe relates back to the whole electricity debacle in Texas recently. Um, we had the storm come through, knocked out everybody's power. We had a bunch of issues and everybody's like, oh, we could have never expected it. And then all of the people who like think with their heads are like, yeah, but like 10 years ago when we had the Super Bowl, the exact same thing happened. We had some snow and everything shut down. All the electricity grid had problems. And we should have seen this coming. Um, and so much like here with the electricity grid, after that happened, they're like, well, we have an option to fix this. It's just going to be expensive. Um, and the people are like, nah, that's too expensive. I don't want to spend $150 million keeping my house and my lives safe. Uh, let's just do the halfway measure. Let's do the less costly fix. And we'll just, you know, half it. Uh, and it didn't work, obviously. The 2005 landslide showed that that approach was ineffectual, and you should have gone ahead and done the big thing, and you might have ended up a little bit better. Um, so still a highly desirable place to live, I guess. It depends on your uh, worry about how much the hill above you is going to come down and kill you. Uh, so property values have dropped after each landslide, however, rebounded in a few years, because people are like that. That's what we do. We're like, yeah, Florida gets hurricanes like all the time and the hurricanes knock down people's houses. But if a hurricane hasn't happened in the last two or three years, I'm still going to pay a million dollars for a beach house, knowing that it could be knocked down next month. Because why not? It's not going to happen to me. Uh, the same thing happens in California every year. The wildfires come through and burn down people's houses. 
And then the next day they're on the news, I'm going to rebuild my house in the exact same spot. Um, and 10 years later, you know, it could happen again. Uh, sometimes it's okay because, you know, we got to live somewhere. You can't just live nowhere. And it's not like there's really anywhere in the world that you're not going to have some sort of risk of disaster. But also, if the hill keeps falling down and knocking your house down, maybe don't rebuild your house right there. I don't know. It's, it's, there's a give and take here you got to be a little bit aware of. Um, so this is what they're talking about. You literally live at the bottom of a super steep hill um, that just isn't very secure. And you have wildfire season. You have heavy rain season. Um, if you lose even just a little bit of trees here or you get a whole bunch of rain, um, you can see this is not rock. Um, this is not like uh, sandstone layers or like some granite. It's just loose soil. Um, and if it gets weighed down and it, it gets a little extra added weight because of water, uh, it's all going to fall. And you can see this part of the neighborhood has been taken out. You can see here you've got some houses that have been completely covered up. Uh, this is a, a pretty big threat. Now, you might live in a part of the neighborhood that's not that threatened by the landslide. But still, uh, this is not something you should take lightly, especially living at the bottom of this hill. Uh, and so I don't know, I, let's see, let's see, let's see. It looks like this would be the 1995 one, and this would be the 2005 one. Maybe I'm backwards. I don't know. Uh, they're pointing to this house both times, so I think, yeah, this is the 2005 one, because the 1995 one did not come this far out. And then the 2005 one you can see came came further out. Uh, next time, you might expect it to come even further out if, if we're following this little trend here. So we start to talk about mass racing. They will come back to that example in La Conchita uh, at the end of the PowerPoint. So mass wasting as a whole is just down slope movement. So you have to have some sort of slope or hill. Um, and it's got to be due to gravity. Gravity is pulling it down. Uh, so it's going to go fast. It's not going to be a slow thing. We'll talk about the slow stuff in the next chapter uh, with subsidence and soil. Uh, but you have a rapid downslope movement of rock or soil um, as a coherent mass of so one big flow all of a sudden. Um, includes earth flows, rock falls, and avalanches. Uh, and they mean both you know rock and soil avalanches and snow avalanches. Um, they can kind of be described as both. So described collectively as landslides, um, the technical term we use in geology is mass wasting. So slopes are most common landforms are, slopes are most common landforms on earth. I guess there should be a V there. Um, all slopes are constantly evolving and materials are always in motion down slope. Um, gravity, time, weathering and erosion are, are gonna flatten out all the hills. Um, give it a certain amount of time. If we didn't have plate tectonics, the earth would be flat. We may even be like a water world because everything would be just eroded down into the ocean. Uh, side note, everybody hates on water world as a movie. I love water world. It's, it's a great movie. Um, and, and Kevin Costner is an American hero. Just saying that. Uh, slopes are composed of different segments, high cliff, uh, free face, talus slope, convex slope, straight slope, concave slope, um, these are just different kind of features you can uh, apply to a hilled area. So they have a couple of those um, labeled here. You got your free face, which is just like your cliff face. It's going to be vertical or very near vertical. Um, if rocks fall off of that sheer face and kind of pile up down here at the bottom, um, that is what's going to be called our talus slope. Um, so talus is your, your little rocks that have kind of broken off of that cliff face. Uh, you have a convex slope, you have a concave slope, and then you have a straight slope in between. Um, and they're just labeling the stuff on top as soil. So here's your free face. So this has basically been kind of like all of the rocks that were on top have kind of... Uh, then pulled off by gravity and slid down the side. And so that's your free face. Uh, your talus slope is building up down here. And then every time, so you can kind of see with this little curve right here, this was the huge section that broke off. When it breaks off, it all crumbles as it slides and it forms your talus slope. 
um, but it's taking out trees down here. And you can see, like, even this area down here where there's not a lot of rocks that have been piled up um, still have trees that are missing um, because if a rock is big enough and it falls down the slope, it's going to keep rolling until it hits a tree. Um, some trees are going to get knocked down by the rocks. Um, even if they don't get fully knocked down, they could get damaged enough where over time the tree just dives off. Uh, and so you kind of have like a little clearing down here at the bottom because of all the rocks that are coming off. So you do have to be careful of this. Um, we don't have much of this here because Texas is pretty flat. But um, does anybody ever drive up towards, uh, what's the lake? Joe Pool Lake and Cedar Hill. If you drive towards Joe Pool Lake and Cedar Hill, you go on 1382. And there's a hill that they cut through. It's basically, I don't know why. I guess it's easier and cheaper. But we're like, we don't like to drive over hills. Let's just blast through the hill and make a straight road. Um, and so you have these two, like, sheer cliff faces on either side of the road. Uh, and there used to be just open where you could go to them and kind of look at them. Uh, I think I've been in there. I don't know if we went, like, on a geology field trip or if I just stopped to look. Um, but now... They have these like little guardrails and signs posted that are like, don't walk here, don't stand here, don't stay here at all. Um, because rocks are constantly falling off of that cliff face. Um, it's, it's eroding, it's weathering, and it's just loose and dangerous now. And you can probably go there for a little while, but you want to wear a hard hat because at any given time, a rock might just fall right off of the cliff face and smack you on top of your head, which would not be a fun day. Um, so types of landslides if they just fall like if you have just a a straight cliff face and the rock just falls off until it hits the ground that's your falling one uh we have sliding stuff where if i have a like a nice slope and the rocks come loose they're going to slide or roll down uh, and then you have a flow which is a movement of unconsolidated material like a creep or an earth flow um uh, creep is going to be very slow so i think in general that might, uh, it kind of fits in both this chapter and the next chapter. Um, earth flows, debris flows, and avalanches are your rapid stuff. Um, creep is going to be your very slow stuff. So uh, many landslides are complex combinations of both sliding and flowage. Um, very rarely do you only get one particular thing. Uh, generally, you're going to have a breakup of material, and they're going to do a little bit of both. Classification of downslope movements. Um, you want to look at the mechanism of the movement, what's causing it to move, uh, the type of earth material, the amount of water present, and rate of movement. And the water present is very important because water does two things. Um, water is very heavy. If you've ever had to carry water any particular distance, like a, a big amount of water, water is very heavy. Uh, and it acts as a lubricant. So you get water in between all your rocks and your soil. And it's going to allow it to slide down the slope uh, much easier with much less friction than if it were dry. Uh, and then the rate of movement, how fast it's going to be moving. So common types of landslides and other downslope movements. you got your falling, sliding, flowing, and then uh, more than one, which is going to be complex. And under each of these, they kind of have the, the subcategory. So for sliding, you can have a slump, you can have a soil slip or a rock slide. For flowing, you can have an avalanche or a creep or an earth flow or a debris flow. And then I kind of describe each of these. So here's some images to kind of go over each of them. Uh, a rock fall is going to be a vertical cliff where literally it just falls straight down until it hits something at the bottom and kind of piles up in a talus slope. Um, your earth flow is going to be like a fast uh, kind of soil avalanche. Um, so not really rocky. Um, it's not like a creep, but it happens quickly, and it all just kind of slumps down the hill all at once. Usually this is going to be associated with heavy rain and soil inundation for water, so the water really weighs down the soil, and it all comes down. Um, a rock slide, this is going to be similar to what we saw at Enchanted Rock. Um, with the whole like outer layer breaking off like a like an onion skin and it just slides down that slope until it kind of piles up down here at the bottom. Uh, soil creep. This, we actually have quite a bit of this in Texas. And soil creep um, and subsidence are, are very expensive. In Texas, uh, driving down the road, you ever see like the wonky 
uh, telephone lines or power lines where the pole is all bent, that's because of soil creep. And it's basically the top layer of soil. So they put the pole in, it goes down pretty far, uh, but the top layer is actually moving relative to the bottom layer. So maybe there's a slight gentle slope. It's usually not super steep, um, especially around here, but it can be steep. Um, but the top soil is just slowly going to inch its way down there. I mean, it's moving like maybe a couple inches per year. Um, not very fast. It's going to take multiple years for you to get that bend. But basically, the pole is so deep, the bottom stuff is not moving, and the top stuff is, and it just kind of pushes the telephone pole over. You can see the same thing with fence posts. Um, if you don't sink your fence posts very deep, uh, you'll get the same kind of stuff. If you see someone's privacy fence kind of doing the lean, uh, that's because of this kind of soil creep. Um, this, like a mixture between soil creep and earth flow, also happens a lot here near our highways. Um, because we have to build overpasses and it's usually just a pile of dirt that we run the road up on until it gets to the bridge. Um, you can have this kind of earth flow and soil creep creep out and they have to go in and fix it because you got to have a good foundation for your road. Um, then they got some rock slumping and some complex sliding, which has a little bit of several of these. Um, but your rock slumping, the key here is it's got this kind of curved, uh, face where everything slides on. So instead of just sliding straight down, it kind of makes this curve thing where the top looks like it goes straight down and the bottom looks like it comes out. Uh, and so it's a little bit of a different mechanism for how it's actually moving. Uh, let's see, trees affected by soil creep and housing. So you can see these trees down here have done the same thing as the telephone poles. Um, the bottom is stunk deep. And the top is slowly sliding down the hill, and so it's pushing it over. Uh, the thing about the trees, though, unlike the telephone poles, the trees are still alive. And so as they get pushed over, the trees respond, and they, they follow the sun. They grow towards the sun. And so you can see at the base here, they start out at an angle, but the trees have corrected themselves to kind of stay upright. And so that's why the trunks are curved at the very bottom, is because of that soil creep. Uh, this is an image. Woo. This could be from one of those houses uh, or somewhere near that, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, you got some, some nice houses, nice balconies. I imagine that's a good view from there. Um, but the hill behind you is threatening and looming because you've had multiple landslides here. Uh, you can even see this house is, is like cordoned off by safety uh, fencing. So... Um, you're not living in that house anymore. And I imagine this person living here is probably a little bit nervous about it. Uh, driving forces move materials down slope. It's gravity. It's the weight of the slope material, how much gravity is pulling on it. Um, vegetation can, can not only hold your soil kind of in place with its roots, it can also weigh it down. Vegetation holds a lot of water. Your roots will help keep the water from flowing away. Um, fill material or buildings. Buildings are very heavy. You got to worry about your foundation that you're building on. Uh, resisting forces oppose downslope movement. So most common is shear strength of the material. Um, if you have more rock than soil, you might be held together a little bit because your rock is less likely to just completely fall apart. Um, so the resistance of the material to sliding or flowing along slip planes is very important. Some Land is just less inclined to have landslides and rock slides than other land. Uh, slope stability measured by the safety factor SF. It's the ratio of resisting forces to driving forces. Um, and it, it's probably just as simple as that. If your resistance is stronger than the gravity that's pulling it down, then you're probably safe. Um, you probably have a pretty stable hill. If the gravity is stronger than your resisting for forces, then you're probably gonna have landslides or movements pretty often. Driving and resisting forces determined by interrelationships of all the stuff that we talked about before, the type of earth materials, the slope angle, uh, the climate, the vegetation, how much water is, is present, and that kind of goes with the climate. Um, are you in a really dry area, or do you get lots and lots of rain, or is it seasonal? 
And then time. Time is always going to wear stuff down. Um, and you could live next to a hill that has never had a landslide before. And then all of a sudden it does. Time. Time is coming after you. Um, it's it's going to pull everything down and wear everything down. Um, the role of earth material type. So what type of material do you have? Uh, what kind of minerals? And are the minerals strong? Are they more opposed to, to like breaking apart and sliding down? Um, or are you going to have something like a clay, um, which in general is pretty weak, and then you load it up with water, it's going to get very heavy. It's going to be able to move very quickly. Uh, it's not going to be a good material that you want to live next to. Uh, degree of cementation, how consolidated it is. Is it just loose soil? Is it an actual rock? Um, are there cracks in it? Are there faults in it? Is there a place for it to start this whole slide off? Um, and then the ability of the material to transmit water. Uh, if the water doesn't soak in at all, you're good. You've got lots of rain off, runoff. Um, you're not going to weigh down that slope with the weight of the water. Um, but if you have, like I said, like a clay material, that soaks up all the water and doesn't really let it go, one rainfall can make your hill literally like much, much more heavy than it actually is. Uh, and then you can trigger a landslide. And then your mineral composition, uh, shale or weak volcanic pyroclastic material failure occurs as creep, earth flows, debris flows, or slumps. Uh, rock falls occur when very resistant rock overlies weak rock. Um, and so sometimes you think you got good material and then just underneath you have something bad and it all starts to slide. Uh, we talked about degree consolidation. Is your rock soil or is it like packed together and cemented together as an actual rock, like a sandstone or something like that? Um, the presence of zones of weakness, are there already cracks, faults? Um, if you have a nice solid rock, then you're probably pretty good. If you have a rock that has all sorts of little cracks and, and weaknesses in it, um, that's not going to be great. And then your permeability, how much water stays in the soil. Um, if your water can't flow out of the soil, you're probably going to have a lot of trouble keeping the soil on that hill. And then also the slope itself. Um, I mean, anybody standing on this beach can see how steep that slope is. Um, Gravity is going to pull it down. Uh, you wouldn't want to just like stroll down this hill from the top to the bottom. Um, you're going to be going like really slow and taking steps. Um, has anybody ever like climbed a hill that was really steep and noticed how easy it is to climb up and how much slower you have to go when you go down? Yeah, uh, that's that's kind of the thing is it's when you're going up, you have this level of control when you're going down. Um, you're going the same direction as gravity, and so there's a little bit less uh, easiness to your stride. Um, and so you've got to be aware of how steep these slopes are. Uh, there's people. They labeled the people down there. But, yeah, you can see the slide has happened. You can see it's fresh because there's nothing growing on it. And then you have your pile up down here where all the material has landed. Uh, let's see. Here's another one. Anytime you see the lack of trees, where there's already a whole bunch of trees, um, you know that some sort of landslide has happened. Uh, and then they even put up like a barrier here to keep the landslide from coming out onto the road and affecting traffic. So uh, they know that it's happening here. They're trying to, to put in a little bit of preventative measure. The role of slope and topography. So I kind of mentioned that. How steep is your slope? Um, Where is where's it going? Um, how long can it kind of resist this gravity and this force that's always pulling on it? Um, and don't forget about that. Gravity doesn't ever quit. 24 hours a day, forever into eternity, gravity will always be pulling down on this stuff. Um, and so it only takes one moment of weakness, and gravity is going to take control uh, and exploit that and kind of pull everything down. So here's another example. Um, this is obviously not in the U.S. Uh, you can just kind of tell by the way the buildings are built. But this is an extremely steep slope to build your house right next to you. Um, probably, I'd imagine in this country, not a lot of options on where to build and, and uh, try to find a better place. Sometimes it's just a, a matter of your circumstances. But uh, this is an extremely steep slope. And you can tell that the people knew that just by the way the vertical the verticalness, um, how the houses are built so vertically, 
uh, with with multiple stories on top of each other. I mean, this you could argue this is like a what eight story building right here. Um, that's pretty crazy. How do you even get to this top level? I guess there's internal stairs, but uh, those that's that's kind of impressive how that's built up there. Um, but yeah, this is very very steep slope. Not even a lot of vegetation here. Um, these aren't like huge, well-developed trees or anything. Uh, you got a couple trees here and there, but uh, this is not a great place for a landslide. And judging by how green it is, you probably get a lot of rain all the time. So uh, the role of climate, you know, if you if you live in a place that has a lot of rainfall, um, it, it's going to affect how stable your slope is. Uh, even with all those trees there, that water just weighs everything down. Um, and it also goes with the amount and the timing. If you get the really heavy rainy seasons where you just get rain that, that pours for weeks at a time, um, it can really weigh everything down. Uh, vegetation is going to do two things. So, like, obviously the roots add strength and cohesion to the slope materials, but... Trees are heavy. Vegetation is heavy. They hold a lot of water. They can add to that weight. Um, and while the roots can add strength and cohesion to your slope materials, they can also exploit weaknesses. Um, we've seen pictures of trees where the roots kind of grow into cracks and kind of open the cracks up even more. Um, and so it can kind of work both ways. Uh, sometimes they help out. Sometimes they kind of exacerbate uh, the kind of... Uh, risk that that is in a slope uh let's see what do we have here climate and mass wasting oh picture a this mountain has been deforested um it should look something pretty close to picture b um but the economy here is apparently based on logging and and somebody wanted to log and so they went and cut down all the trees and you can expect that this area is going to have a lot of landslides in the future um those trees hold that slope together, and after just a couple years of being exposed to weather um, and, and the constant force of gravity, you're going to start to have a lot of landslides. Um, good news is it doesn't look like this is very inhabited. There's not a lot of houses or neighborhoods around here. Um, but still, deforesting, especially on uh, cliffs and hills, is, is usually a bad thing. Uh, and then I guess I don't see anything bad going on here. So they're just comparing the deforested hill to the, the still forested hill. Uh, let's see. So roadside stuff, we see this all the time in Texas. Uh, you know, you build up a hill to put a road on uh, and everything starts to creep down slowly. Uh, and so you can see here, this was just grass. And this area with no grass is just kind of slumped down. So you just want to be, be aware of that, be prepared. They've kind of covered this up with us with uh, some tarps until they could fix it um, because they know it's probably going to rain. If it rains some more, your exposed soil here is really going to get taken down. Um, and so until they could come in and fix this properly, they've kind of done a quick fix uh, like you would with a roof or something that was having damage um, just to kind of protect it from the, the moisture. Which is why they talk about the role of water next. Um, what, we've already talked about water. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, you know, it, it's very heavy. It changes how your materials hold together. It adds lubrication. It adds weight, um, and in general, can just ease the downslope movement uh, for pretty much everything. Uh, it's a slip and slide. I mean, you don't want to slide downhill on a dry slip and slide. That doesn't sound like a fun birthday party. Throw some water in the mix, and everybody's having a good time. Uh, mountain thing. So you have your erosion is undercut this road here. Um, uh, mountain roads get this a lot because mountains are just constantly getting weathered and eroded. Um, here's, I guess that's the Pacific ocean. Uh, yeah, they're right next to an ocean cliff and, and, uh, you can't live here anymore. Sorry. I don't know how much you paid for this house, but you're not selling it and you can't live here anymore. So it's just total loss. Um, actually, me and my wife, one of the nicest places we've ever been. Uh, on our honeymoon, we went to this place called Colette's in Washington. Let's see. Uh, Washington, whatever. Uh, Colette's. 
no, not college. You know what I type. I type it right. College. Let's bed and breakfast. Fort Angeles, Washington. There it is. Fort Angeles, Washington. Uh, uh, I want Google Maps. Sorry, Apple Maps is the worst maps ever. Sorry if anybody likes Apple Maps, but you're missing out. Fort Angeles, Washington. So, uh, where are we? Where are we? Is that Fort Angeles? Here we go. Somewhere around here. No, I think it's further down. Let me do this. Let's bed and breakfast. Okay, so here's where he stayed. Super nice place. Uh, park right over here. They have this big house. We stayed in like one of these little bungalows over here. Uh, huge, huge trees. A nice place you can sit here. And it's hard to tell, but uh, oh, how old is this? This says 2021, but I don't think this picture was taken in 2021 because when we were here, the cliff is, is much closer to the house. Um, I mean, you're like right up next to the edge of the cliff and you can sit on this bench and kind of look over. But we, we drove around a little bit and we came down here, we turned on this street and we came over here and here we go. All of these houses now are condemned. Um, they, they have yellow like police tape around them and the people can't live here. Like you can see there's cars here. This is an old picture. Um, these people have been removed from their houses because of how close this cliff is. Uh, and so these are really nice places. I mean, this would be like, I'm telling you right now, if somebody was like, hey, I'll just give you a house here and you can just live rent free, I'm out of here. I'm going to live in Washington. This was like the nicest place I've ever been. Um, but the cliff, the cliff encroached. And when you live that close to the cliff, one landslide away and, and half your house could be gone into the ocean. Um, and they, they don't risk that with people. I guess they have some sort of formula. Uh, when the cliff gets too close to your house or there's a certain amount of instability, uh, they bring in geologists and the geologists are like, yeah, this is really sketchy. And then they're like, sorry, but you got to move out of your house. Um, I don't know what kind of compensation you get. Probably depends on the local government and how it's handed. Um, but in general, I'd imagine it's a huge loss for the homeowner. Um, but these people right here, you know, wait 30, 40 years, maybe 100 years, and then you got cliffside property. Uh, you're just, you, it's only improving for these people right here. Maybe you don't have a road to drive out of your house, but you got a nice house there. Uh, <laughs> you don't like your neighbors across the street, just wait a little while. It might fall into the ocean. So uh, you want to be aware of these kind of things. Um, famously, in Texas, uh, let's keep going. But remind me sometime this week, uh, y'all are probably a little young. There's a house on one of the lakes in Texas that had this same thing happen. Like this, right on a cliff. The cliff started to, to erode away, and the house was basically literally falling into the lake. Um, and it's this huge thing. There's like news helicopters circling around. There's boaters down there, and the police and fire department are afraid that the house is literally going to fall on people in boats that are trying to get a view of this. Um, and so what's their solution? They're like, we'll burn it down. We're just going to burn the house down. And so the fire department gets a pallet of hay, and like gets, uh, I don't know who's the person to volunteer, but they get a forklift and literally drive a pallet of hay into the garage. And then from like 20 feet away, throw a Molotov cocktail onto the hay and burn the house down. And there's like helicopter footage of like flaming pieces of the house falling into the lake. Uh, it was just amazing. It was an amazing day for local news. Uh, so, sorry, had a little side track. Let's keep going. Uh, curve in the coastline here, what they're pointing out is this curve in the coastline is going to get a lot more wave action. It's going to get a lot more erosion happening than, than some of the other pieces. 
Um, and so the houses that are built out here on the edge are probably the ones that are in the most immediate danger. Um, more than likely, the people who bought these houses weren't aware of that, but they're going to be the ones to face the trouble sooner than later. Um, here's the landslide that's happened. This house used to probably be up here. Um, and so that's an issue. No, I take that back. The fence is down here. This house was at the bottom of the hill, and then the hill came and crushed the house. So uh, not a good day for those people. Uh, snow avalanches, rapid downslope movement of slow and ice. And notice they, they call them snow avalanches because a rock avalanche is, is uh, an acceptable term too. So uh, sometimes with rock and vegetation in the snow, uh, thousands occur each year in the United States and Canada. Uh, three variables interact on this, the steepness of the slope, the stability of the snowpack, and the weather. Um, and basically, if you've ever been to a snowy area, or, or know about this stuff. Um, they try to combat snow avalanches by going out. They literally send people out with tiny sticks of dynamite and they ski the hillsides and they'll place dynamite charges and try to cause an avalanche while nobody's there to get some of that snow pack off the mountain uh, and make it a little bit more safe because the snow's eventually gonna go down one way or another, whether an avalanche or through melting, um, but if you can kind of control it and test the stability of the, the snowpack, uh, that's going to be a good thing. So uh, two common types of snow avalanches, loose snow avalanches where it all kind of just mixes up, and then your slab ones where it moves as like one cohesive block. I'd imagine the snow avalanches are, are more common than the slab ones. Um, it does say the slab ones are more dangerous and damaging. Uh, so... There you go. And here's some avalanche. So this is, obviously there's no snow in this picture. Um, these are a couple avalanches that have happened when there was snow. Um, you can see there's no giant pile of rocks in these channels here. Um, and so that kind of leads, leads me to believe these, these were in fact snow avalanches. The snow would have piled up up here where there's no vegetation. Um, and that's one thing you can tell. Where your vegetation line stops, that's the area of the mountain that's covered in snow during most of the year. Um, and so uh, this would be your normal snow line in the winter. It all piles up on this very steep slope. And when it goes down, it's going to knock down all these trees on its way. Uh, and so you know that an avalanche has happened here, even if you didn't observe it directly when it happened. And they kind of have a little map here of where all the avalanches happen. Because, you know, if you live in this neighborhood, I want to know where the avalanches have happened every year um, and kind of be prepared for that. 7.2, geographic risk and risk of landslides. Um, anywhere that has hills or mountains is going to be at risk for landslides. Um, the more factors you have that, that kind of help that along, the worse off you're going to be. So more urbanization, uh, more tree cutting and changing of global climate patterns can affect your landslide chances uh, quite a bit. Uh, high to moderate risk of landslides, Texas, flat old Texas, flat old central part of the country, no landslide risk at all. Uh, you get into the Rockies, you get into California with their seaside hills, um, you get into the Appalachian Mountains, and you got higher risk for landslides and, and movements like this. Uh, are we almost time to go? I was so, like, I'm always so optimistic. Like, I can get through these PowerPoints super quick, just blow through it, um, like halfway through maybe. Uh, so yeah, we'll leave it there for today. Real quick, uh, let me see if I can find the video. Yes. I want to hear Wednesday or Thursday. Okay. Um, do you know what we're doing? Uh, so Wednesday, I will be at UIL. Uh, and so we'll have a sub, and it's going to be work on your lab day, okay. your paper lab. Uh, Thursday, I guess we'll be finishing up this PowerPoint. So we'll be able to watch the lecture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see, Texas house uh, slides into lake fire. Let's see, let's, those keywords should help me out. Uh, is this it? Six years ago, seems maybe right. 
Yep, there he is. So the video starts with the firefighter throwing the Molotov cocktail into the Hayfield garage. Uh, I forget what lake this is, but this is a lake uh, in Texas. You can see it's starting to burn. Look, the house has already collapsed partly into the lake. Uh, so, like, it, it's gone. You can't live here. No one's going to buy it. There's no way to fix it. It's a total loss. So let's just burn it down. That's the best way to do it. Uh, you can't get, like, a bulldozer in there to remove it. Uh, at best, you just help its, its demise into the lake. And so they literally set it on fire. There goes the roof down into the lake. Uh, this unfolded like over an entire day on live TV. You can see this is recorded from a helicopter. Uh, and so I remember this day vividly. This is crazy. Uh, and, you know, this, this is better than like a police chase. Uh, this is good TV here. So uh, there's a lot of that stuff. Uh, that was just one quick video. But... Uh, if you're interested, you can go hunt that down. So.